Have you ever met someone who's always complaining about everything? They complain when it's too cold. They complain when it's too hot. When the food is not spicy or when the food is spicy. When the car driving in front of them is driving too fast or it's driving too slow. They are complaining about everything in life. Life is a big conundrum for them. Life is a big burden for them that needs fixing all the time. Then there is this other category of people. People who are always running. People who are always running. Life is a race for them. Whether they are going to work, whether they are going to school, university, marriage, children, no matter what they are doing, even church, they are always running. And dare you stop them because they think if they stop, they will stop breathing. They always work at the warp speed. Then there's this other category of people, people who look always tired, people who always look weary. You ask them what the problem is and they'll count 10 issues to you which has nothing to do with them. You ask them why are they tired today? They'll tell you that they, will be, they were doing someone else's work, they were fixing someone else's car, they were cooking for someone else, they were changing someone else's baby's diaper, they were filling someone else's forms, they were doing that, they were doing this, but has nothing to do with them. These kind of people have a syndrome which I call Savior Syndrome. These people think that they have been specially anointed by God to solve world issues. Then there is this final category of people. People who are blasé about everything in life. They don't care whether someone lives, they don't care whether someone dies, they don't care how they behave, how they look. The biggest contribution from them to this world is whatever. That's their biggest contribution to this world. But the common thing among all these people, all these different categories of people, is all these people, they never stop and enjoy life. They're always busy chasing something. They're always busy fixing something. They're always busy complaining about things or they're indifferent towards everything. By the time they realize that enjoyment is actually a word, they are ready with a frame in their hands to walk or they are ready to be carried on four shoulders. They never stop and enjoy life. This is true for most of us here as well. We never stop and enjoy life for two reasons. Either we are trying our level best to be Christians. We think God is a dictator who's standing with a whip and I got to be on the ball all the time and the moment I drop the ball, God will just crack his whip. And we try to be the best Christian possible and we are always tensed. What if this goes wrong? What if that goes wrong? What if I do this? What if I do that blunder? God will just whip me. And the other reason we don't enjoy life is because, because we're trying like everyone else to Make it big in this world. I got to be an edge ahead of everyone else. No matter whether I'm a student, whether I'm in university, whether I'm working, I got to be a better husband than my neighbor. I got to be a better wife than my neighbor's wife. I got to be better, 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 better. And we don't enjoy life. In our pursuit to be or to do Christian, or in our pursuit to make it big in this world, we forget that God has given us this life to enjoy. I wonder if you're enjoying life. I wonder this past year, have you stopped and enjoyed life? Some of you here are veteran Christians. You've been walking with the Lord more than the years that I've been born. Are you enjoying life? Are you enjoying your walk with God? Or has your walk with God been reduced to a ritual? Has your marriage lost its vitality? Has your spouse become a habit rather than a partner to enjoy, a life partner? Students, the best years of your life, whether you're in school or your university, has these years become mundane for you? Has it become a drag for you? Adults, are you reigning in life? Or has your life just become about 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday to Saturday? Predictable and boring. 
and you can't enjoy Sunday because you're too tired. Ministry workers, church leaders, worship leaders, home group leaders, do you enjoy serving God? Do you enjoy your ministry? Are you enjoying your ministry? Or you're only doing this because a pastor asked you? Are you only doing this because no one else is doing it? Or do you really enjoy it? Or has it become a burden for you? Because if you're not enjoying it, then stop and think. Because your life has a use-by and an expiry date. Your life has a best before, a use-by, and an expiry date for some sooner than others. Turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Book of Ecclesiastes comes after Proverbs, before Songs of Solomon. The verses will be there on the screen, but I would still encourage you to open your Bibles. The book of uh, Ecclesiastes is written by King Solomon. And we are going to look at chapter 9, verses 1 to 10 today. And in this passage, Solomon gives us three reasons why we stop enjoying life. Or what are those three reasons that hinder us? From enjoying life. And then he goes ahead and gives us the solution. How we should enjoy life. What we should do to enjoy life. So problem one. Problem one that Solomon gives us. Why we don't enjoy life. Is because we want to be in control. We want to be the boss. We want to control our life. Now there are two extremes of this problem. The first extreme is. That we, like diligent Christians, want to know God's will for our lives. We lose our sleep over knowing God's will for our marriage, our career, our jobs, our house, which car to buy, which suburb to live in, how much money to put in offering every week, which missionary to support, which, which ministry to choose. We lose our sleep over knowing God's will for these decisions in your life. My question is, why do you want to know God's will so desperately? Is it because you really want to please God by knowing God's will, or is it for some other reason? Because if you really want to please God, you know God's will. God's will is right here for you. God's will is revealed in his scripture. Deuteronomy 29.29 29 says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed to us are for us and for our children forever, so that we may do the words of this law. God's will is right here for you. I wonder if you are so desperately seeking God's will to gain more certainty in your life because you can't take a step in front without planning it. You want everything to be planned out concretely in your life. You want to know every detail of your life before you make a decision, before you make a choice. And that's why you so desperately seek God's will. The irony is that in order to seek God's will for your life, desperately, a lot of you are wasting your God-given life and time in order to know what God has planned for your, God, for your life. The second extreme. The second extreme is some of us think that God has given us brains. God has given us wisdom, so let's use it. Let's use it to its optimum level. And therefore, 10-year plans come out. Your Excel spreadsheets come out. You start strategizing. I want to be here when I'm 30. I want to be here when I'm 40. I want to be here when I'm 50. I want to be a vice president by the time I'm 40. I want to be a CEO by the time I am 50. I want to be a senior pastor by the time I'm 19. You start planning for tomorrow and you stop living for today. You take 
everything, you take the reins of life in your own hand and you start planning, you start running with it. Janice and I got married eight years back uh, and we entered our marriage with a lot of debts, primarily from my side. And even before we got married, we had this desire, this, this noble desire, this wonderful desire to get equipped in a Bible college and to serve God full time in ministry. But of course, our desire, our dream was constrained. We could not immediately go to the Bible college because of the debts. So the moment we got married, our first and our primary goal was to get over those debts. We wanted to work hard. We wanted to clock in 13 hours, 14 hours a day. And we did. We worked hard so that we could get incentives, we could get overtime, we could get better salaries, promotions, only so that we could pay off those debts and go to Bible college. We got exhausted. And our friends stopped us, this couple, and said, what are you doing? What are you doing? Rather than entrusting your dream in God's hands, you have taken control of it. You have taken complete control of it. And you're running it without God's strength. And our ministry suffered. The ministry that we were involved in in those years, it suffered just because we wanted a future dream. Trust me, we had it all worked out. We had our Excel sheets. Worksheet 1, plan A. Worksheet 2, plan B. Worksheet 3, plan C. If plan A would work, plan Plan A would fail, plan B would work. If plan B would fail, plan C would work. But if plan C would have failed, I had no idea what to do then. It was all worked out for us. But we didn't realize that our pursuit to pay off our debts, to go to a Bible college, just exhausted us and crippled our ministry. If you are a person like this, I have a bad news for you. Chapter 9, verse 1. But all this I laid to heart, examining it all, how the righteous and the wise and their deeds are in the hand of God. Whether it is love or hate, man does not know. Both are before him. Solomon is saying that after surveying everything on this earth, everything that happens under the sun, he has reached to a conclusion that both the righteous and the wise and their work is in God's hand. Man does not know anything. You do not know what is going to happen to you in next half hour. Whether it is going to be a day of love or it is going to be a day of hate, whether it is going to be a day of adversity or prosperity, you do not know because God has concealed it from you. You are at the mercy of God's sovereign, unscrutable and unsearchable will. Stop trying hard to control life. Solomon, who's the epitome of wisdom, who's the wisest man ever existed, saying it's futile. You can never be in control. God is sovereign. You can never be in control. So the first problem, what hinders us from enjoying life is that we try to be in control. The second problem, we always compare things. Contentment for a lot of us is a foreign term. We have this habit of looking out. Grass is always greener on the other side, no matter how cliched that saying is. But that's true. We are never satisfied with what is in our plate, whether it is our grades, whether it is our school, whether it is our university, whether it is our parents, whether it is our siblings, whether it is our job, our boss, our girlfriend, our boyfriend, our husband, our wife, even our church. We are never satisfied. And Christians somehow develop this philosophy that we are better than others just because we know about God. And God forbid, if you have gone to a Bible college, if you've gone to a seminary, then you're in a class of your own. We think, or we start believing that we deserve better, or we deserve the best, because we do things for God. And if others get better deals than you do, 
if your neighbor gets a better car than you do, if your colleague gets promotion faster than you, or if the student sitting right next to you bet gets better grades, then it's a bad day for God. You'll give God a hard time. We whinge and we whine. Verse 2. It is the same for all, since the same event happens to the righteous and the wicked, to the good and the evil, to the clean and the unclean, to him who sacrifices and him who does not sacrifice. As the good one is, so is the sinner. And he who swears is as he who shuns an oath. What Solomon is saying, that this Joe who lives right across the street from your house, this Joe who is a murderer, who is a swindler, who is an abusive father, who is an abusive husband, who is a God-hater, gets same portion of adversity and prosperity as you and I. And not only that, this Joe who is a God-hater, he has the same end as you and I dust and ashes. You might have more people on your grave, but trust me, you won't know it. That's how life is. You ask question, why? Why God the evil is prospering? Why God wicked is prospering? Why God this person, this colleague of mine who's cheating, who's doing every possible thing under the sun, which does not come under the rule of God, it's still getting promoted. Why is a student sitting right next to me who's cheating blatantly and still getting good grades? And here am I, a Christian, who's doing things that you want me to do and still I'm not prospering. Why? 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 And the answer is because God has ordained it that way. That's how life is. You might not get all the answers to your why question in this life, for sure. So we want to be in control. We always compare things. And the final problem is that we are corrupt. Read verse 3. This is an evil that is done under the sun, that the same event happens to all. Also, the hearts of the children of man are full of evil. And madness is in their hearts while they live. And after that, they go to the dead. Bottom line is that we are all sinful. Our hearts are bent to do evil. All our desires and our motivations are to do evil. We place our satisfaction. We place our contentment in wrong places. We place our desires in wrong people. And as a result, you get disappointed. Your parents disappoint you. Your siblings disappoint you. Your boss disappoints you. Your husband, your wife, your children, they disappoint you. And you end up disappointing yourself. Because that's now how the world is supposed to run. That's now how the world is supposed to be. world has been bent and has been twisted. And God has twisted it. And no one can untwist what God has twisted. We are sinful. Therefore, our desires and our affections and our motivations are not in the light place. So we want to be in control. We always compare things and we are corrupt. Isn't life frustrating? Isn't life frustrating? Solomon looks like, or sounds like at least, a top category pessimist. But is he really? Is he really anti-life? Is he really a pessimist? Or have we understood life wrong? Have we figured out life wrong? Because if Solomon was a pessimist of top category, he would have said, go, stand on a cliff and jump off. If he was a pessimist, he would have said, take a gun and shoot yourself. But he doesn't say that. Instead, see what he says in verse 4. See, read verse 4. He says, but he who is joined with all the living has hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. 
they have no more reward for the memory of them is forgotten their love and their hate and their envy have already perished and forever they have no more share in all that is done under the sun what solomon is saying that is better to live with a dishonorable name rather than to die with an honorable name because people who are dead have lost it they have finished this life but the people who are still living can enjoy this unique life that god has given them your service to god your relationship with god your relationship with others that is all unique in this life this life is a special life because god has created this life for you and for me this is a unique life we are going to spend eternity with god praise god hallelujah for that but this life is a special life for you and for me so how do we make most of it if this is a special life if this is a unique life then how we make most of it and the solution is as easy as it might sound but the hardest thing to do the solution is that we enjoy life by considering everything when i say everything i mean everything as a gift of god we enjoy life by considering everything as a gift of god verse 7 go eat your bread with joy and drink your wine with a merry heart for god has already approved what you do enjoy common things in life enjoy your enjoy the basic necessities of life enjoy the little things that god has given you enjoy the freedom that you have in delhi here at least for now to preach to teach and to read god's word there are many parts of this country and there are many parts of this world where christians do not have freedom to even do this basic thing forget about this enjoy the basic things of life Enjoy the good mattress that you sleep on. Enjoy the good clothes that you wear. Enjoy the car that you drive. Enjoy the bike that you ride. Enjoy the good food that you eat. Enjoy the plethora of options that you have in this place to enjoy and entertain yourself. Enjoy the basic things of life and above all thank God for your health. Ask a handicap what it means to lose a limb. Ask a blind person what it means to lose your sight. and ask and often what it means to lose your parents if you have all that praise god and enjoy it because that's god's portion for you and if you are enjoying that god is pleased with it so enjoy common things in life enjoy your close relationships verse 9 Enjoy a life with the wife whom you love all days of your vain life that he has given you under the sun because that is your portion in life and in your toil with which you toil under the sun Solomon here is talking about the relationship between husband and wife the word enjoy here does bit of a disservice to us the original word the hebrew word is much more profound the hebrew word here talks about or the word here is the word to see is the word to observe the picture that Solomon is painting here for husband and wives is that you enjoy life with your wife you see the life passing by you just sit together and you see the moments of your life passing by together you see the years of your life passing by together you see your love increasing together as you grow old you see yourself growing old together the picture is of this this complete enjoyment together even though this passage is only talking about husband and wife and i want to extend it to other relationships as well so enjoy your family enjoy your parents enjoy your siblings enjoy your grandparents enjoy your friends you don't know how much time you have with them enjoy these close relationships because they are god's gift to you enjoy common things in life enjoy your close relationships and finally enjoy your work verse 10 whatever your hand finds to do do it with your might do it with your might for there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in shoal 
to which you are going. Do the best, whatever you do. And enjoy whatever you do. Of course, within reasonable parameters. If you are studying, do be the best student you can be. If you are working, if you are pursuing medical field, be the best doctor or be the best nurse you can be. If you are pursuing engineering, be the best engineer you can be. If you are pursuing teaching, be the best teacher you can be. If you are pursuing missions, be the best missionary you can be. If you are if you're pursuing pastoral ministry, then be the best pastor you can be. Be the best shepherd you can be. I was talking to a girl back in Australia, in Adelaide, in our church, and she was so thrilled. One day I met her, and she was so thrilled. I asked, I asked her, her name is Renee. I said, Renee, what happened? Why are you so thrilled? She said, you know what, Joy? I landed one internship today, and this was my dream. I said, so what is it? She said, I want to be an entomologist. And you know what entomologists do? They work with bugs. She was so thrilled about it. Because that's what she really enjoyed to do. She really enjoyed working with bugs. And she was just on top of the world. And she couldn't just stop smiling and sharing with me how God landed her this summer internship. God wants us, God wants Christians to be on the top rank of every vocation so that his word can be proclaimed in every place. And that is possible if only you enjoy your word. And do it with all diligence and integrity. Enjoy common things in life. Enjoy your close relationship. Enjoy your work. Life is like a vapor. It flies very quickly. If you try to grab it, it will go out of your hands. I'm sure for some of you this year looks very exciting. New beginnings, marriages, kids, new cars, promotion, new house. Exciting. But I'm sure for some, it's just another year. In fact, for some, this year might not have even started on a good note. So no matter what it is, no matter what this year holds for you, enjoy life. But within reasonable parameters. Because Solomon also says in chapter 12, verse 13, The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments. But this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. You call to be salt and light of this world. Christians are called to be salt and light of this world. And the only way you can be salt and light is when everything, when people around you are getting crumbled under the pressure of this world. When people are getting crumbled, when life throws tough times at them. In those situations, when you are enjoying life, there is something different about you that people will take notice of. And people will say, yes, there is something different about this community. This is an uncommon community. And the way that you can live such a lifestyle is when you know that your today is secured and your tomorrow is glorious. And we know that God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We know that whom he called, he justifies and whom he justifies, he also glorifies. The hope that we have is a glorious hope. And it is that hope that keeps us going. We know that our identity is secured in Christ. We know that our tomorrow and our today is secured in Christ. Christ has overcome this world. So enjoy life. Enjoy life. But that is God's portion for you. That's God's portion for you.